Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. I'm Brian Finster. I've been a software engineer for around 30 years. I spent the last third of that working on developer platforms to enable continuous value delivery. And it's super re rewarding work because it helps people, um, you know, it kind of makes work suck less, honestly. But today I'd like to take some time to discuss, on, you know, at the end of the day, why platforms don't matter. Now, as an industry, platforms become super important over the last 10, 15 years, and we keep looking to build the next great platform. But what does that really look like? They just make things easier to get done. A good platform allows us as an organization to define and ensure standards for security and compliance, while also making it easier for teams to deliver quality solutions at the speed of relevance. You know, they're self-service. They, they help us eliminate handoffs between teams. They enable teams to own their own quality process because nobody can define that but the team. And it enables teams to deliver on demand. But if we don't understand how to use the platform correctly, if we don't understand the capabilities it enables, it can hurt more than it can help. We can do things like, oh, well, now we can automate everything and just ship things really fast and blow things up. And I see the same problems keep recurring in many organizations. Someone decides that they need to deliver faster, so they kick off an enterprise transformation. They bring in new tools, they bring in coaches for their favorite agile scaling framework, and then they spend a lot of money and wonder why nothing improved. And the question I have is, did they look at their product strategy at all? Did they look at how work is done from end to end? You know, the, the first acronym I ever learned as a developer was garbage in, garbage out. And I, I wonder if anybody else has actually heard of that. Are they separating uh, development and testing still, or are they trying to move that together? How about that eight to 12 week PI planning process where we spend a couple of days sitting in a meeting coming up with our fantasy goals? Platforms cannot fix these fundamental flaws on how we operate. And this isn't a new problem, and it's not special to our industry. People have been using silver bullet transformations for decades to try to copy other people's success. And I want to talk about one of those. So in the first half of the 20th century, the way factories would work is they would have material resource planning teams. And those teams were relatively large. I mean, if you think of a factory that was typically around 300 people, you'd have a team of 20 people whose job was only to plan how much raw material they need to bring in, what sort of uh, work had to be done to process that raw material to uh, provide the output that they needed to meet their contracts. It was manual and slow. And because of that, they would plan uh, one month ahead and only plan for you know every month. Then in the 60s, the first computerized MRP started appearing, and Black & Decker was an early adopter of these platforms. They're famous for it. This allowed them to make material planning much more efficient and much faster. And other manufacturers started seeing Black & Decker Im improving their outcomes and being very successful uh, after they implemented MRP systems. And so they said, hey, we need an MRP system of our own. And this meant that they could reduce staff and, 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 and plan with less overhead. But they didn't see the same outcomes that Black & Decker was seeing. They weren't seeing all the improvements. Well, you know, the reason why is because Black & Decker recognized that this new platform wasn't just a way to reduce headcount. This was a enabled new capabilities to allow them to run planning batches more frequently. So instead of planning every month, they could plan every week. And by running these planning batches more frequently, they could level out the peaks and valleys in supply and demand and make the factories much more efficient. They were able to leverage this new capability to change how they operate and improve outcomes, not just automate people's jobs away. And because of that, they were able to better meet their customers' uh, needs. Now, this was 1964 when they implemented this, and there's famous case studies on it, and there's also famous case studies of 1984. Because 
You fast forward to the 80s and Black & Decker had a huge problem. Over the last decade, short-sighted cost-cutting and lack of investment in basic infrastructure had left them, in, for the first time ever, losing money. In fact, they were now buying some components that they used to make in-house and were spending more to do it. They'd lost the expertise in building it, they'd outsourced it, and now it was costing them more money to get lower quality in components from somewhere else. Their time to fulfill customer orders was eight to 12 weeks. At the same time, the retail market was changing and the large retailers were demanding fulfillment within a week so that they could plan to meet their demand. In fact, the retailers were writing contracts that had clauses in them that would cancel the order if the date and sometimes even the hour of delivery was missed. And so Black & Decker had some fundamental things they needed to change. So what's the obvious solution? The obvious solution is just to make the factories produce faster. You know, bring in some Six Sigma black belts, measure individual uh, productivity of the people doing the work, and find ways to make people work faster, and just produce more output, right? You know, and strangely, that wasn't what they decided to do. Instead, what they decided was that they were going to focus on what they called quick response manufacturing. They had this goal of being flexible and being able to respond rapidly to the customer's need. Well, to do that, it's far bigger than just a factory. They had to take a holistic view of everything required to deliver products so that they could respond to what the customer needed and when they needed it. They could deliver the right thing at the right time. Of course, they invested in their factory tooling. You you know, if you've left things to to degrade. You've got to improve that. But they also took the best lessons from agile manufacturing and just-in-time inventory management and applied them to their context, along with some other things that they knew how to do better that just isn't in a book somewhere. But this still wasn't enough to meet their goals. They needed to address the entire value stream, not just the factory. It doesn't matter how quickly factories push out product. If it's the wrong product because you didn't do your product development correctly, if it's at the wrong time because you're overproducing things that people don't want to buy or producing it too late and and they're going to buy it from somewhere else, if you can't process orders quickly enough because your order processing system is too clunky and manual, or if your logistics just won't allow you to deliver efficiently, you have to look at the entire flow of how we get, you know, something from, Somebody wanted something until they get it to them and improve everything to get it done. They also needed to improve their tooling to support the strategy they needed to upgrade their MRP systems. 20 years ago, there were pioneers in using manufacturing resource planning to revolutionize how they were doing business then. But this is 20 years later. The business has changed and the systems hadn't changed with them, so they needed to upgrade. And these new systems provided them a much broader view with better data of their entire flow of production. So they were able to make better and faster data-driven planning decisions to further improve the efficiency of how they worked and reduce the, the just garbage in their flow. And the outcomes were this from this were outstanding. They had dramatic improvements in fulfillment rates. They improved every aspect of their value stream, from marketing and R&D to logistics, and they leveraged the tools that provided the capabilities to do that. The result was shrinking lead times by an order of magnitude from, you know, 12 weeks to one week, historically low inventory levels, and they gained the ability to flex with the changes in the marketplace. They were truly agile. Not only did they pull themselves out of a death spiral and turn uh, and return to profitability, but they became leaders in manufacturing again. Now, of course, uh, once more, this caught the attention of other manufacturers. And once more, they tried to copy Black Industrial's success. And once more, they focused on the wrong lesson. Let's upgrade the systems. We need better up- uh, MRP systems. That'll make it happen. They didn't have a strategy, but they did have money to spend and a myopic focus on making factories work faster, focusing on that productivity. Millions of dollars later, 
and nothing changed other than people learned how to work the same way with the new systems, just as they had before. Now, why am I talking about manufacturing? The software is not manufacturing. You know, honestly, there's a lot of parallels. And while people will claim there aren't, they are wrong. And here we are four year, 40 years later, and we keep seeing the same mistakes, this time in software. Transform the enterprise. Instead of taking a holistic view of value delivery of what it takes to go from idea to end user and get feedback, companies continue looking for those silver bullet solutions and tools and frameworks. They focus on how to make developers more productive, meaning how do we improve output? They buy new tools and bring in process change and focus on the least important thing, the coding. And it didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. But what do they do when it fails? We have this new platform. We're measuring individual output. Why aren't we delivering faster? We can automate tests now. Why isn't quality better? Maybe we just need smarter people. Then they look for the next silver bullet. Maybe AI will fix it. I promise you AI doesn't replace thinking. AI doesn't replace strategy. AI doesn't replace leadership. We can't keep playing the same old game with different tools and expect different outcomes. We need to change everything about how we help our end users so we can be flexible, respond rapidly as their needs change, and deliver at the speed of relevance. And in today's threat environment, be able to deliver at the speed of threat. Developer platforms that enable teams to execute this business strategy are essential to our goals. They enable so much, but they can't compensate for a lack of leadership. They can't cover up a lack of mission and goals. If we're incentivizing the status quo, they can't create change in how we work. If we don't focusing on building quality in and focusing on making quality part of the process, and making sure that we own the quality, platforms can't cover up for that lack of quality ownership. Platforms don't automatically fix long delays in quality and product feedback. If we have processes that, that prevent that, a platform's not going to fix it. And platforms absolutely don't replace investing in the people who do the work, making sure they have the best information possible and the knowledge of how to use it. Now, those of us who work on building the tools needed to supply, need to supply solutions that make mistakes more difficult while making the right things easy. That's our job as platform engineers. However, it's not enough to supply the tools. We also need to help our users understand how to use those tools to their maximum advantage. They need to understand how to build quality in, work in small batches, let the computers do the boring work so we can focus on solving real problems as humans and relentlessly improve our methods and our outcomes. As people developing platforms that enable these capabilities, we should be experts at doing that. And I think we also have the responsibility to share that expertise. This is the problem we're solving. We should help our end users also solve that problem with the, 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 the tools that we provide. You know, I started off with saying platforms don't matter. Maybe they do. I mean, having an effective platform is a game changer. It absolutely is required to, to, for our goals. Unless we keep playing the same old game. We have to change the way we work to leverage platform capabilities or we have capabilities that are useless to us. I'm passionate about this topic. The company I work for is passionate about this topic. Let's compare notes. I've got a blog out there where I talk about some of these things, uh, the, the entire value stream. You can read that at blog at brianfenster.com. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm somewhat shouty about how do we deliver software better and make it less toilsome and make the job suck a little less. And if you're interested in making continuous delivery for national security easy, fast, and secure, Check us out at defenseunicorns.com slash careers because we need your help. We have a lot of smart people and we could use a lot more smart people because it's a big problem to solve and we can solve it together. With that, thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.